Yeah, thank you. And so I'll be presenting the work we've done with my advisor, Véronique Cortier, on electronic voting and why you can't have privacy without verifiability. <coughs> so electronic voting is this idea of using computers to, to organize elections. So it can take several forms, um, notably voting machines inside of polling stations that people use to vote, or remote voting where people vote from the internet. And we'll be focusing more on this second aspect here. Um, uh, electronic voting has several advantages. It's more convenient, both for voters who can vote from their home or from anywhere without having to go to the polling station, or for authorities, because it's easier to, to record and tally all the votes. And many protocols have been proposed to, to organize elections uh, this way, such as Helios, Bilinius, Civitas, for instance. But of course, um, as always with uh, cryptographic protocols, there is the need to, to ensure that they are actually secure. So let's have a look at what a voting protocol typically looks like. So you can see on the left, we have voters who are willing to take part in the election. And they send their votes inside of ballots to the ballot box. The ballot box collects all the ballots and then publishes them on a public built-in board that everyone can see. And then finally, uh, the third telling authority is in charge of comp com computing all the, the, the results by counting the, the votes from the public bulletin board. Or alternatively, it's also possible that the ballot box would directly transmit the ballots to the telling authority without using a public bulletin board. Now, typically, um, there would be a, a pair of a public and private key generated at the, at the beginning of the election. And the voters would, for instance, encrypt their votes with um, the public key. And only the, the telling authority would have the secret key that would allow it to decrypt the ballots. Now, the problem with electronic voting is that we have a, a complicated attacker model because there can be dishonest voters that are willing to, that are trying to, um, to interfere with the, the election process. The attacker may also con control the, con may also control the, the network, the, um, the channel between the voters and the ballot box, which would allow him to drop some ballots, for instance, and so that they never reach the ballot box. The attacker can also control, in some cases, the ballot box itself, which would let him um, change the, the content of the box. And uh, finally, the attacker could also control the telling authority, which would let him publish a false result for the election. Now, with it, with this all these possible corruption um, scenarios in mind, what does it mean for the for voting protocol to be secure? Well, several properties have been proposed to express the security of a of a voting scheme, um, notably privacy. That is the fact that no one should be able to know who I voted for, and verifiability. That is everyone should be able to ensure that the, the result that is published for the election in the end corresponds to the to what the people wanted to vote. That the votes have been correctly counted. Now there are other stronger properties such as receipt freeness or, or coercion resistance that formalize the fact that. I should not be able to prove how I voted to someone else, even if I wanted to, which prevents um, people from coercing me into voting to, for, some, for some candidate, because I can't prove to them that I follow their instru instructions. Here in our work, we're focusing more on privacy and verifiability. So more in detail, um, vote privacy. What does it mean for the vote to be private? When we say the vote is private, what we mean is that an attacker should not be able to know who voted for who which voter voted for which candidate. So formally, this will be an indistinguishability property where the attacker is trying to, the attacker sees, uh, as you can see on the figure, the attacker sees the, the results, that is one vote for zero and one for one. And the attacker should not be able to know whether Alice voted for zero and Bob for one or the other way around. Now, verifiability is usually defined as the, the conjunction of three sub-properties that are individual verifiability, that is, um, I should be able to check that my vote is correctly put in the ballot box. Universal, universal verifiability, that is, everyone should be able to check that the result that is published corresponds to the content of the ballot box. And finally, eligibility verifiability is uh, yeah, the fact that um, every ballot that's, um, that is in the present in the ballot box should have been cast by a legitimate voter that was allowed to vote. And together, these three three properties compose verifiability. Now, the thing with privacy and verifiability is that they the two properties seem opposed at first. 
because intuitively privacy is the fact that you want to publish no information or as little information as possible about the way people voted <coughs> so that no one should learn how they vote but on, on the contrary verifiability for verifiability you need to to publish at least some information to to allow people to check that their votes have been counted and in an in extreme case if you really really want to be private you might say well well let's just encrypt all the votes and send them directly to the to the tallying authority and the, the tallying authority there is no public built-in board the tallying authority will decrypt them and only publish the results so nothing is published except the results but if you do that of course it's not verifiable because the, the tallying authority could publish any result it likes and no one can check that it's actually the the correct count for the votes on the contrary if you really want to be verifiable you might say well let's just everyone will say that will send their votes in clear and uh, unencrypted and then it's very verifiable because everyone anyone is able to, to compute the result and check that it is the right result but of course it's not private at all and in general the the two properties really seem to be opposed in that um the more you try to have one the harder it will get to also have the other one in fact there is even a theoretical result that says just that that states that um, unconditional privacy is incompatible with verifiability so the unconditional here means that that we give we consider an attacker that has unbounded computational power so an um, all powerful attacker um, and then in turn um, the, the regulations about electronic voting choose one of the two properties over the other typically in France uh, only privacy is required for electronic voting protocols in Switzerland, privacy is required, and then some verifiability is seen as an additional feature. But priority, privacy is um, also prioritized. But um, so, well, but actually, what we show in our work um, is that, in fact, privacy implies some verifiability. Uh, that is, in, um, namely, individual verifiability. So the fact that everyone should be able to check that their votes is in the ballot box. So this may seem um, strange and counterintuitive, given all I've just said before. Uh, I, I'll get to how it's possible uh, in a minute. But first, um, note that for now, it does not contradict the, the previous results that I stated, because the result uh, that was known, the impossibility result, was only for uh, an unbounded attacker. But here we're considering, as is usual for cryptographic properties, a polynomial attacker. Then this result also raises a few interesting questions. First, uh, how is it possible that, that some protocols have been proved to be private without being verifiable? Um, it is, there, there are some instances in, in the literature of this. Um, and also, what does this tell us about privacy? It seems that there is something that is not um, well understood about privacy, since it implies verifiability, while um, people thought it did not. Um, so I'll get to these two points uh, in a few minutes, but for now, it's a bit more, a bit more um, detailed look at what we actually prove. So how do we define privacy? We define it as a cryptographic game. Um, this is a, a well-established approach um, that dates to, to Benalo. Uh, and this game formalizes the, the idea that I've stated before, that the attacker, um, should be, the attacker will be able to choose to propose two distributions of the votes. And one, we will use one of them in the election, and the attacker will try to guess which one was actually used and the attacker should not be able to, to guess correctly. So we have the, the game written here, and we see that there is a private bit beta that uh, will determine whether we use the, the first or the second distribution of the votes chosen by the attacker. And then we, we run the, we will, we'll give access to the attacker to two oracles that let him cast votes and make honest people votes. So the casting oracle Let's the attacker choose any ballot it wants for the for dishonest voters, and they are put directly in the ballot box. Then the voting oracle lets the attacker choose two distributions of the votes for honest voters, and we will use one of them. So for any honest voter, the attacker will propose two votes, V0, V1. We'll put the ballot for V beta inside of the ballot box, and we'll record V0, V1 for the, for the purpose of the game. Then we'll show the result of the election to the to the attacker, and the attacker will try to guess beta, so to guess which one of the two distributions it proposed was used. So the idea is that if the attacker is not able to correctly guess beta, it means that the attacker is not able to distinguish between two distributions of votes. But actually, uh, th this would be too uh, uh, strong, too strong of a property, because um, of course the attacker can see the result of the election, so the attacker can anyway distinguish between two distributions that do not give the same result. And that's why we have this additional condition here, 
Um, we only show the result to the attacker, provided that the two distributions it proposed uh, give the same results. And then we define the advantage of the of the adversary, as is usual for uh, indistinguishability games, as the difference of the probabilities that it answers one, um, depending on whether the secret bit was zero or one. And we say that the, the voting protocol is private if no attacker has a non-negligible uh, advantage. Now, the definition for individual verifiability is also a cryptographic game. This time, the intuition is that um, the attacker should not be able to change the result somehow. So here on the on the drawing, you see we have three voters, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, who vote 0, 1, 1. And the attacker tries to interfere with the, the, the ballot box or the election process in some way so that the result does not contain the votes. Doesn't the result? The, the attacker breaks individual verifiability if it can make it so that the result does not contain all the votes from the honest voters. So in the game, again, we have the attacker has access to a voting and casting oracle that, as before, uh, the casting oracle lets the attacker choose any ballot it wants for these honest voters. And the voting oracle lets the attacker uh, choose the how honest people vote. And we record how the, the honest people voted in, the, in some list, which we call voted. Then we compute the result of the election, and we check whether the, um, the result contains at least the votes from honest voters. So here we see we have the result should be the, the count for the honest votes that we have recorded in, vote, in the voted list, and some additional votes that correspond to the votes for dishonest voters. And we'll say that the attacker wins the game if the attacker is able to make it so that the result does not contain the votes from all honest voters. Yeah. So again, we'll say that the, the protocol is individually verifiable if no attacker has a non-negligible advantage in this game. Now, with these two definitions, we can state our uh, main result, which is that privacy implies in individual verifiability in the sense that if there is an attacker that has non-negligible advantage in the verifiability game, then there is an attacker that has non-negligible advantage in the privacy game. Uh, I, I won't get into details here, but we also, in our paper, prove the same results uh, in a completely different model, which is a symbolic model um, similar to process algebra. And we show uh, um, this, the very similar results with the same ideas of the proof, which shows that our result is gen a general property of voting systems and not uh, dependent on the precise choice of the model. Um, I will try to give you an idea of how this how this proof works. So the idea is that as you, we will assume that there is an attack on individual verifiability, and we will construct an attacker that can um, break privacy. The intuition is assume that there is an attack on individual verifiability. So for this for the example, I'll I'll assume that the attacker can break individual verifiability by being able to turn um, some voters' votes into one. Say. We have Alice, and the attacker is able, no matter what Alice chooses, to make it so that the result is one. If the attacker can do that, then let's consider an attacker against privacy. So as before, we have on one side Alice voting for zero and Bob for one, on the other side Alice for one and Bob for zero, and the attacker is trying to distinguish between these two cases. Now what can the attacker do? The attacker can just replay the attack on verifiability on Alice to make it so that her vote gets replaced by one, and then the result on the left will be uh, one one, and on the right one zero. That is to say, in, it will be one and Bob's vote. And then the attacker is able to learn how Bob voted, which breaks privacy. Um, so that's the idea of our of our proof. Of course, here I presented it in a simple case where we know precisely how the attacker breaks verifiability, but we show in the paper how to generalize this idea to any attack on verifiability by um, writing a reduction between the two games, the cryptographic games, for um, verifiability and privacy. Now, what do we learn from this result? Um, what we get from this is that if you're trying to, to make a voting system and you want it to be private, you have to, to care for, the, for verifiability. You can't just say, I'm trying to, to design a private voting system without caring at all for verifiability, because this won't work. You have to at least have individual verifiability when you're, in order to have privacy. So, um, this means that um, the, 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 the individual verifiability is not going to happen, happen by itself. In, if you want to have individual verifiability, you have to, to somehow incorporate mechanisms for it in your protocol. And this means that these mechanisms are also important for privacy. If you don't have them, you can't have privacy. <coughs> but then, as I mentioned, yes, some protocols have been proved to be private without being verifiable. For instance, the Helios protocol, which is a uh, 
well-known voting protocol, um, has been proved private without even modeling the verification steps. So the protocol provides some verification mechanisms for the voters, but uh, it has been proved private without modeling them, uh, which um, should not be possible because in that case, it's not verifiable. Actually, this comes from the fact that our results say that privacy implies verifiability with the same trust assumptions with respect to the, to the election authorities. While what is usually studied is privacy against an honest ballot box, but verifiability against a dishonest ballot box. And this is why this does not contradict our results, but this is a problem because protocols are trying to be private against a dishonest ballot box and not just an honest one. So this shows that there is a problem with the existing definitions of privacy. That is, they, they usually assume that the ballot box is honest, which is really a weaker property than the privacy the protocols are trying to achieve. Um, why do they do that? The, the thing is that it's hard to define privacy against a dishonest ballot box, because if you're just adapting naively the, the definition I showed before, uh, it won't work. It will be a very strong property that will never be satisfied, because if the ballot box is completely dishonest, the ballot box could just Let's say the ballot box wants to, to learn how I voted. The, the ballot box can just drop every ballot except mine, and then the result will show how I voted because it will be my vote. So we need a new definition for privacy that is the, that, that says something about the privacy against a dishonest ballot box, but avoids this issue. And here we propose a new definition for privacy with our result in mind. That is that since privacy is related to verifiability, we have to take to take, um, to take into account the, the verification mechanisms provided by the protocol in order to, to write pri the privacy property. So how do we do that? We write, again, a cryptographic game that formalizes the idea that the attacker should not be able to distinguish who voted for who, provided that all the voters perform the verifications as specified by the protocol. So the game is very similar to the game I showed before. Again, we have a uh, secret bit beta, and we'll, the attacker will choose two distributions of votes and try to we'll use one depending on beta, and the attacker will try to guess which one. But this time, the, the ballot box is completely dishonest, so it's directly provided by the attacker. And the attacker, again, has access to a voting oracle that lets mm -hmm. him choose how the honest voters vote, proposed two distributions, and we only use one. But this time, the difference is that the attacker has, then the attacker is then given access to a, another oracle that lets him um, make people verify. So we have this oracle here in blue that lets the attacker um, trigger the verification mechanism of the protocol for any voter of, of its choice. And then we only show the results to the attacker in the case where uh, it has made all honest voters to verify. So the attacker is only shown, shown the, the result of the election, provided that everyone checked the vote has been counted. So this, um, with this definition, we, we show that our results still hold for our new definition. So privacy against a dishonest ballot box with careful voters, as we define it, um, implies individual verifiability against the dishonest ballot box. And we show that uh, to show that our uh, definition has some relevance, we apply it to a few existing voting protocols. So Helios, Bilinius, Civitas, and the uh, Neuchâtel protocol. All of these have been proved private against the anonymous ballot box in the literature. And as I said, there is a trivial attack against them for the for the dishonest ballot box with a naive definition. But we see that with our definition, we are able to spot some differences between them, to, to distinguish between them. Um, to, we see that we are able to capture some attacks that were previously known uh, in the case where the ballot box is dishonest. So this shows that our definition, while well, it's a first proposal, it's not perfect, but uh, it has some relevance because it it's, um, highlights some differences in how in what privacy people get in the in the in the case where the ballot box is dishonest. So to summarize, we show this counterintuitive result that, um, contrary to what we might think, privacy implies individual verifiability. We prove it in completely different models, computational and symbolic models, to show it does not depend on the model but is a general property. And this property, this result gives us a better understanding of how privacy works because it shows that to achieve it, you need some verifiability, at least individual verifiability. Uh, it also highlights some limitations of the current game-based definitions because they mostly consider honest ballot boxes. And um, we propose a new definition of privacy against a dishonest ballot box using the ideas from our results. And as future work, we are planning to 
to write a more general definition because this one is rather limited um, because it only says something about privacy in the case where everyone checks their vote and we plan to study more realistic scenarios where only some people check. Thanks for your attention. If I understand uh, correctly, the the attack is that uh, if I don't verify, someone else loses their privacy. So yeah. it's even worse, right? So it's not, it's not like we would want something where my privacy is preserved if I check, but it's actually much worse than that. Someone else doesn't check and then I, I lose, yeah. right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, the people who verify protect each other and pro somewhat protect the other, but they the idea is yeah, if, if you don't check, the others can get attacked. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm wondering how your model handle revote case, or would it be possible to handle revote? Um, so our model uh, handles revote, and in the simplified definition uh, that I showed here, it doesn't it doesn't appear. But in the actual definition we propose in the paper, we we can handle revote um, by having a revote policy where, for instance, the the last votes of of each voter is counted. Only the last vote is uh, is kept, for instance, and. It works the same, basically. Uh, I would like to ask about, uh, did you consider um, the relation between non-coercion and verifiability? Are, what are the implications there? So we haven't. Um, but in principle, um, non-coercion is supposed to be stronger than privacy. Because if you're not private, you can be coerced. Mm -hmm. So it should also imply verifiability, but we haven't really looked into that. Yeah, because it's my my intuition was that uh, verifiability kind of rules out non-coercion because if you're verifiable, in a sense, you can also no. It's it's possible to be both verifiable and uh, and and to be in coercion resistance. There are some protocols have been okay. Been proposed maybe maybe I'll ask you later. Thanks. That was really cool. Um, Thanks. So I was wondering. There's a so the the. Uh, the dishonest ballot box attack, the trivial attack you described, there's actually a similar attack on mixed nets. So that you know the first hop in the in the chain mm -hmm. can drop everybody else and figure out what message you sent. Yeah. Um, I was wondering uh, towards a more general definition. I was wondering if you thought about this stuff in relationship with uh, to anonymous communication. Wait, wait what? Uh, towards a you were you were talking about you yep. you were looking for a more general mm -hmm. definition of 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 privacy. Yep. Um, have you thought about the connection to um, anonymous communication and things like mixed nets? Um, not really, but uh, you, you you you're talking about things like anonymous channels. Um, yeah, between. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, our our result mostly uh, holds when there are no anonymous channels, mm -hmm. but uh, we haven't. Really looked into it yet, but it, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, okay, all right, thank you. I was just curious whether you whether um, you had any thoughts about whether privacy against a dishonest ballot box is possible. I mean, it seems like the dishonest ballot box can always tally the votes without the last voter and then with the last yeah. voter. So you need some kind of a further assumption about the model. Yeah, the idea is well, it, it's possible to to get if everyone checks that their votes have been counted and have not been removed. But it, but it can privately compute the tally right without releasing it. Compute the incorrect tally, not including the last voter's vote, and then compute the real tally and publish that. Um, what, what do you mean the incorrect tally and the not tally? I mean, because to I mean, it privately computes the tally at every step, at every time a vote is cast. But, but the ballot box cannot compute the tally. Only the telling authority can compute the tally. Oh, I thought I didn't see. I, I thought the ballot box has the secret key at all. No, times. If, if we get back to the to the ring I show here, yeah. So you see, the the telling authority has the secret key. And is in charge of decrypting oh, I see, the ballots. I, see. I, I thought okay. I thought you meant something different. Then. And here we're assuming an, an honest telling authority that does not cheat in that way. So hi, uh, I, just, I was just wondering if you have a like a solution scheme for this kind of problem because like it seems to me in the traditional cryptography, the zero knowledge proof like zk snarks, that kind of stuff can actually give a new solution to this kind of conflicts. You know, so because you can actually prove the verifiability that you are the register user and also you can like keep your privacy by putting the putting your uh the the ballots putting your votes into the witnesses so yeah that, like that kind of solutions if, if you have any well the, the, this has been used in protocols in private practice that that already exist yeah so but it does not really um i mean you still have the problem that if you do not check that your vote has been counted if you if then if in the end you do not check it, it's still possible to remove it 
also we have to do it in some way. And uh, so your definition of verifiability is some um, like, yeah, okay, I get it. So switching the whole stuff in in the bell box. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. One last quick question and quick answer. Uh, not exactly a crypto person, and I think I what I'm gonna ask may be related. So you show that the case for two voters, Alice and Bob. But if you go to n voters, does that mean that you need to change n minus one to either all zero or all one to learn the last one? Uh, yeah. So yeah, in in the intuition, I showed there are only two voters, but in the actual proofs, yeah, we have the, you can have as much as many voters as you want, and uh, in that case, yeah, you may ha you might have to to change the vote of n voters to learn the vote of n other voters, for instance. Yeah. Well, but not only. Well, so you're making it very obvious something is wrong because all of a sudden somebody is getting a landslide win. Is it true? Hmm? Basically, to learn the vote of one person, you're yeah. giving one of the candidates a landslide win. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. Then in that case, yeah, you're, you're spotted. Maybe okay. yeah, it's possible, yeah. But it depends because it might also be possible, for instance, to remove some, some of the votes and replace them uh, with instead of uh, for a, a, a vote for the same candidate, you could replace them with a following a plausible distribution, and then it's harder to spot you. So. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.